I'm with Nick Barrett here, author of Spirit Guided Lucid Dreaming. Hello. And we're being joined by Cookie the Cat, who's insisted on sitting on my lap for this particular video. Uh, Nick, so when we talk about lucid dreaming, as I'm sure most of the viewers will know, we are talking about the fact that you become aware during the dream of the fact that you are dreaming and adopt a certain degree of control. Mm -hmm. Now, most of us take a rather anthropomorphic stance on this. That is to say, we take the position that it is me, Rory in this case, having the dream and the person I'm dreaming about is also me and I'm meeting other people who are in effect reflections of my own self somehow in this experience. This is a very Western, in my opinion, very narrow view mm -hmm. of consciousness. So you have got a background in what you describe as spirit guided lucid dreaming. So you have taken the position of being able to interact with the other proverbial entities in the dream. Yeah. And therefore, I'm going to put the question to you, who are these other entities? Who are you? What's your relationship? Who in effect is having the dream? I believe it's, uh, it's still you in essence. Uh, you are uh, consciousness having a metaf metaphysical experience um, within the dream state with a great level of pure awareness and, uh, and consciousness. So when you are meeting these other spirits, you are merging uh, with the spirit frequency, if you like, mm -hmm. um, and you are communicating on a, a consciousness to consciousness level, mm -hmm. um, but without any physicality. So it is pure metaphysics. Okay, so uh, an expression we had kind of uh, thrown up between the pair of us earlier on today was the notion that if a thought became self-aware, what would it think it is? So. I guess to kind of put that in perspective, if a thought, that is to say, when you are dreaming, what in effect is happening is that you are taking the, the posture, the, meta, the metaphorical, the metaphysical posture of a thought, and that thought in a lucid dream becomes aware of itself, and therefore, by doing so, starts to self-reflect within this dream state. Mm -hmm. So in effect, what is happening here is the thought itself is becoming aware of itself during the dreaming process. And it's looking around, interacting with its environment, and if lucidly aware enough, is able to actually question the nature of its own reality during that experience. So I guess then the question is, who in effect is actually having this experience? From what you're saying to me, it would seem what you're alluding to is the notion that all of this experience is in effect you. And when I say you, we now have to adopt a, a broader spectrum of the term you. You does not imply you as in Nick, you as in Rory. It implies you as in Nick and Rory are in fact the same thing. Is this where we're kind of heading with this? Um, yes and no. I believe that is uh, each and every one of us has a spirit within, mm -hmm. uh, or a soul if you like, there's many terms. Um, mm -hmm. For me, I, I don't like to say spirit or soul. I like to just say a uh, ball of energy, because everything is energy. Mm -hmm. um, this identity, this physicality, this shell that we harbour for 90 to, well, 80 to 90 years or whatever. Um, You're being enthusiastic? Yeah, a very, I'm a bit of an optimist, so <laughs> that's good. Maybe, maybe more than 90 years. But um, it is a temporary shell and um, your spirit then will live on after that, I believe. So when you go into the dream state, either lucid or not, you're actually taking the spirit and it is actually going to these places. Um, places is a, another bit of a term I don't like to use because what you're doing is when you say out of body, you're having an out of body experience, you're not actually coming out of your body. It is consciousness merging with consciousness, or the field of consciousness. So again, this term out of body experience is a term I'm not terrifically comfortable with either, yeah, for the I'm same not reason. Too, um, the idea being, if I'm leaving my body, I'm somehow in my body in the first place. Mm -hmm. And this has a whole kind of a anthropomorphic essay that all becomes very much linear physics again. Exactly. And, and this, I think, is perhaps where the problem is coming from which is the, the, the notion that the world is somehow out there like a fishbowl that you're somehow swimming around in and that there are bits and pieces to that that all interact with each other. This of course then prompts the notion of if there is this proverbial fishbowl floating around that we call the universe, then you know, where exactly did that come from? And, and of course then the question would be, well, wherever that came from surely also has a source and where did that come from? And now we're into a kind of an infinite regress mm -hmm. and that really philosophically doesn't offer much satisfaction. So, in essence, somehow, what it would seem, whether we like it or not, is ultimately we're going to be facing some kind of a paradox. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think this is the battle that, that man's actually going through uh, for decades, which is, you know, uh, does he think uh, in linear terms what the meaning of life is, or does he actually feel from his heart of, of what it is? And you could talk about like the now, 
the power of now and, and you hear a lot of this and I believe that's really where time and space actually just fades away. You, you actually merge with the infinite space now, within the now. The now is a term that gets thrown around. Yeah. I totally agree with you. I say thrown around rather violently. It does actually. And, yeah. and, and misused in the greatest way. We're using them all today. Yeah, so. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's get them out so of the way. When we talk about the now, and, and I'm going to bring this to uh, perhaps a, an understanding that you and I perhaps are more familiar with. We mm -hmm. both have a background in Qigong, Tai Chi, yes. in essence in Taoism not to imply that we have any particular belief system. Uh, somebody who understands Taoism understands that it's not a belief system at all. Uh, on the contrary, it's exactly not a belief system. It's just a way of understanding mm -hmm. the nature of being. Um, and the, the, the notion of the Tao is that ultimately there is nothing fundamental about the nature of reality that we can apply any kind of term to. Exactly. We can't say it's one thing or another thing. We can't say that it has any particular behavior, any particular expression. Ultimately, Every expression is, uh, is mm -hmm. transient, just like Cookie sitting on my lap. It's transient. Mm -hmm. And much I'd like her to sit there forever she wants. <laughs> um, but everything is transient. Yes. So when we talk about the future and the past, then these are polar expressions, just like light and dark, just like left and right, mm -hmm. just like up and down, just like waking and sleeping. Yeah. But somewhere in the middle, it would seem is where the true reality lies. Mm -hmm. Because if something is somehow a combination of the two, then it must be the thing in between. I mean, even the most mm. linear mind can understand that concept. It, it's been said through uh, through time, hasn't it? You know, like Buddha said, uh, it's the, the middle way. It's the middle way. This is an expression. The yeah. Buddha certainly seems to be on the same page for sure. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about that, then in essence, I guess what the true nature of reality is, has got to be some ever-present dream. Because between waking mm -hmm. and sleeping lies the dream. Between future and past lies the present moment. And coincidentally, what happens to time when you dream? I mean, time gets thrown out the window, right? It does. Um, I believe that, I think right now, at this point in time, not right now in the video, but like wherever you are and you just say when you're meditating, you merge with the infinite space or whatever you wish to call it or however you wish to perceive it, they'll, you'll integrate with this feeling that can only be described as feeling. You cannot put words on it. You can't say, oh, I had this kind of feeling that felt like this or felt like such and such. It's impossible. It is absolutely impossible. You cannot. All you can say is that you actually had this feeling which you cannot describe, but you know this particular feeling and that feeling is what we call the now. And again, with Qigong Tai Chi, when I try to explain somebody what it is, it mostly the word I would use is a feeling too. Um, somebody wants to see Qigong, they want to see energy firing out of my hands and I say, you know, without the uh, duty of special effects this can be rather difficult perhaps. It does happen. Some, it does happen, indeed yeah. it does, yeah, and we can get into that another time by all means. <laughs> but for the more cynical viewers who want to be a, a live demonstration right here and right now, let's not mm -hmm. go there. No. Um, suffice to say that when I talk about it, to me, it's what we refer to in the martial arts world is it's an internal martial art. Um, it's an internal uh, yeah. uh, form of exploration. In fact, it was Carl Jung said, he, and I'm paraphrasing here, mm -hmm. he who searches out there is dreaming, he who searches inside is awake. Yes, well, and I think yeah. ultimately this again reflects the notion of Taoism. Taoism tells us that when consciousness starts to spread itself outwards, that it starts to become lost in its own interactions. Mm -hmm. But when you start to redirect that attention inwards, you come back to the source. Yeah. You find between the yin and the yang, between the future and the past, you find that present moment. And what ultimately happens on this journey to the present moment is something gets left behind. And I think what gets left mm -hmm. behind is exactly what you've been saying to us right there, which is the intellectual thinking mind. Exactly, which harbors the, the identity that we carry. It's the, you know, when they say it's the great I am, you know, it's like, who are you? Are you this person called John Smith or, or whatever? And uh, are you male, female? We always have to label it in a physical type of way. And it's actually beyond that. It's so much more beyond that. So this, of course, prompts us to consider the notion of the uh, dualistic uh, process of language as we, as we currently experience it. This, again, is something you and I have spoken to at length on previous occasions when we talked about language being a code, and a code that, in essence, has a certain quality to it. Now, that's a term I'm borrowing from Terence McKenna, for any of you who's familiar with his work. Terence McKenna says that the world is made of language. Now really, this is something I would let Terence McKenna explain rather than try to mm -hmm. elaborate for the audience here, but nonetheless, it very much resonates with the Taoist philosophy. Yes. The idea, of course, being that the world is made of something arbitrary, 
that it's not necessarily something that you can hold in your hands. Language, in essence, is constantly evolving and dissolving. Exactly. The language today won't be the same as the language tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Language, ultimately, cannot be kept in a fishbowl. Exactly. Everything is in a state of flux. Everything is always in constant movement. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to get down to the molecular type of thing where everything is always moving and vibrating at different levels. You could totally go onto that uh, topic, but if you just have the notion of it is what it is, and it's in a state of movement. Okay, well, that's that's what let's, 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 let's not be shy about that subject. Let's talk about <laughs> quantum physics briefly. I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat of a fan there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what quantum physics is telling us in essence mm. is that what you find ultimately is not what is present, but what you measure, right? right? And that, of course, is an essay based on the measuring technology that you're employing. When you start to invent various types of measuring technologies to measure various aspects of the atomic structure, then that's precisely what you find. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's what it is. Mm. That means that that so is a reflection of the technology you employ to actually measure in the first place. Yeah. So I guess the question therefore is, is the thing actually there before you measure it? Or are you actually measuring it into existence by creating technology to find it? Does that make sense? I cannot be sure about that, but what I, what I feel is, um, is that it's, it's your perception and it's relative to that individual. Right, and, but That's again, right. This, is, yeah. this is certainly saying the same thing. Again, I'm probably using more think, technical terms right there and it might yeah, be a little yeah. bit misleading, so pardon me. But nonetheless, I think that ultimately is what the kind of philosophical tension coming out of quantum physics is telling us, mm. is that ultimately reality is somehow subjective relative to the measuring consciousness. consciousness that there's yeah. no such thing as an objective reality. Although many quantum physicists somehow still try to hang on to the idea of that. Um, I know for a fact that there was a, uh, a quantum physics uh, uh, conference in, in uh, I believe it was in Switzerland uh, this month, and a Nobel uh, Prize winner was actually banned from the conference specifically for his interest in Psi. Uh, the, the particular uh, uh, conference was not comfortable with the idea of a scientist of, of, his, uh, of his caliber um, entertaining the idea of uh, psychic ability and was told quite, uh, you know, to, to uh, just not attend. But this is not something I need to get into right now, suffice to say that it just shows you how attached people are to their point of view. Mm -hmm. um, probably we're going to go a little bit too far off piece right there because I'm just going to rant. No, yeah, it's, you rant but, <laughs> but nonetheless, I guess what I'm trying to say ultimately is yeah. what we are learning from this new paradigm of physics is that reality is more elusive than we could have possibly conceived. Yes. That somehow it would seem that anything we put our finger on ultimately is relative to the finger that's pointing. But the thing itself is mm -hmm. never either or. I believe we create our own uh, in, just environment and we, we create our own... Uh, the way we want to perceive life is how we want to perceive it. But not we as a collective, but we as an individual, which then submerges with the collective consciousness. So this collective consciousness, and again, I'm going to borrow from McKenna here again. McKenna talks about how the collective consciousness, or the, the one mind, or the, uh, perhaps the, the, the integrated consciousness, mm -hmm. the hyperdimensional consciousness, what we're trying to approach, the infinite state, the zero state, that somehow what makes it actually, how would I say, what gives it its essence, in effect, is what he refers to as a higher coding quality, right? So if we think about the language that you and I are employing right here as being of a lower coding quality, and the, the lower coding quality, in essence, is a dualistic processor. Absolutely. And therefore, yeah. it tries to distinguish between this and that, and here and there and so forth. In effect, what creates me, when I become that thought that becomes self-aware, it's true process of elimination that I come to the conclusion of what I am. Mm -hmm. And what I do in essence is I say, oh, well, I'm not this, and I'm not this, and I'm not that, I'm not that, and so forth. And ultimately by eliminating all the things I'm not, I must therefore conclude by deduction that I am in fact this. And therefore I kind of then start to forge an identity around that, and that becomes who I am. Whereby what McKenna is alluding to is the idea that somehow the coding quality of the higher state of consciousness is able to recognize that it's all these things together at the same time, but still integrate with the experience. Is this something that you've ever actually experienced with your eyes open as opposed to just with your eyes closed? Absolutely. I mean, there's been many times where I've been in my headspace and completely misjudged the situation. 
and I've gone all the way around the houses trying to work out well, where is that that center you know where mm -hmm. is where is the point of absolute just infinity and um, and belief and, and strength and all those amazing things where it all merges into one mm -hmm. thing um, and I believe when you when you're up here and you're sorry to call it up here but when you're there it's very difficult to interpret this thing called one mm -hmm. or this, you know this this one energy and it's just uh, and this is what the heart does it mm -hmm. brings it's, it this is the decoding mechanism we all share in each and every it's one expression it. decoding mechanism i like that yeah. yeah yeah because it's where if you just go into your heart space and with the act of love as well and when you're mm -hmm. in this unconditional state of love being mm -hmm. there for being at service for others um i really believe this is where it's at and um, for me especially i'm speaking from personal experience i think this is where i'm at right now and uh, I, I feel happy here it's a good i was space to be. listening to uh amit goswami the quantum physicist recently talking about the exact same thing he was talking about the evolution of consciousness and where he believes we're headed in the next say 500 years or so with the ballpark figure he was using he was alluding to the idea that ultimately we'd be moving away from what we would call the thinking mind towards the feeling self i'm not sure what the exact expression he used there the words that i tend to use and and this again is very much um, in, in, in resonance of what you're describing and certainly uh, from, from the way you're describing I can certainly see from what you're actually experiencing in your own life um, and, and I think ultimately this is, this is what it is in mm -hmm. essence this is where we're headed I think yeah. we're dissolving I, I, really, I really like the expression you're using the idea of decoding um, the, the dualistic process mm -hmm. with the heart um, and, and by allowing the light in to, to try to dissolve the, uh, the, the, the dualistic identity that we're parading around with and that's also a good phrase, like dissolve. It dissolves mm -hmm. all that headspace uh, clutter and um, external noise, which we all try and work out and try and pinpoint like, what it is and what is the meaning of time and where is it and all this. You know, it's very, it's very difficult when you try and be like that. And you can actually get yourself into quite a little frenzy because there is no answer. It just is. And again, this is again this is the the, the Taoist notion of Taoist it, notion. it is what yeah, it is. It is what it is. And uh, in fact, a good friend of mine, uh, he, he's a, a Buddhist uh, a Thai boxer, and uh, we always talk about you know Buddhist and Taoist philosophies, Eastern philosophies and the likes. And the expression he uses to me with his great big smiling face is the same always. It is what it, it is. It is what it is. Um, That's a great title for this video. It's a great title. For this video. <laughs> we might just do that. We can dedicate that one to uh, my, my friend Stan Prescott, the uh, the Thai boxer who. Who smiles me time and time again says it is what it is uh, because that's precisely <laughs> what it is, is. Yeah. Um, and that's precisely what a thought being self-aware would think it is it would think it is what it is it because is that's all it could ever be anyway yeah. it could be nothing else because it is in effect identifying itself and it is nothing other than an arbitration of its own circumstances exactly. and yeah. that is I think ultimately where we start to let go of the I'm this or I'm that or I'm this or I'm that, I'm yin, I'm yang, I'm up, I'm down, I'm left, mm -hmm. I'm right, I'm forward, I'm back. Because these are things that create emotional uh, pools mm -hmm. in our behavior. When I talk about an emotional pool, what I'm saying is we start to kind of pull certain emotional uh, uh, feelings uh, about situations and circumstances and those pools start to well up. And mm -hmm. you know, as the day goes on, we start to step into those pools time and time again and as those pools get bigger sometimes we start to drown in those pools exactly. but those pools only exist because we give things attention because we actually believe just because I'm feeling sad right now then I'm always going to feel this exactly. way about this thing yeah. forever mm -hmm. but ultimately when we start to recognize that all the feelings you have all the thoughts you have mm -hmm. all the models you have they're transient mm -hmm. this is the essence this is the key exactly this is this is what the Tao is trying to teach us and another Tao's uh, key point was uh, there are no mistakes so even in the dark times, there is light within that dark time. Absolutely. So, and and yeah. once more to, to kind of elaborate what you're saying right there is that the, the dark times must exist to allow for the light times to exist. And therefore, we must embrace the dark times. You must embrace the pain. Yes. You must embrace. Don't just attach to the pleasure and avoid the pain because that's precisely, mm -hmm. in essence, what you're doing there is you're becoming attached again. Exactly. Um, as much as you're becoming detached, you're becoming attached by the same process. And this is how we learn. I think this is what consciousness is. It is what it is. And it... It's, learned, it's feeding up itself to grow and grow and grow and grow. That's and ultimately, what I guess, therefore, and this is something I know from my own point of view, uh, in terms of what I've learned at, 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 at deeper levels of understanding, what we're being asked is not to understand, but ultimately to accept. To accept. 
And that's the hard part. Fantastic. I think Absolutely. Terence McKenna said, finding the answer is not the hard part, accepting it is. Exactly. And I never really got what he meant about that until I really dug deep mm -hmm. into the nature of things. And but I believe you can only accept it once you experience it. You need to experience it. You um, need to experience it. And that's going back to the whole feeling thing. You need to feel it and experience it. And if you experience it, you feel it. Which is why lucid dreaming and all those uh, other incredible uh, ways of... Uh, Expressing consciousness is also a, a wicked launch pad to get to those places. It is, I'm glad you described it as that. Mm -hmm. Lucid dreaming is, in my opinion, a launch pad. Launch pad. And people should not become so attached to it as to think that it is the be it all, end it all. If you can learn to lucid dream, therefore you are an expert in consciousness. Don't, don't be fooled by that at all. Yeah, no, it's lucid hard. Dreaming it's, is a you tool. have to put some work in. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Bruce Lee would certainly tell you that you won't win a fight with a good jab. Although <laughs> people have certainly, you need a whole lot of other tools too, especially against these modern fighters. And likewise with lucid dreaming, you know, recognize it for what it is. It's a good tool, but you need a lot of other tools as well. Exactly. And people shouldn't get too mm -hmm. caught up in that idea. Again, it's the dualistic process or the thinking mind that's attaching to the solution. We yeah. all want a solution. There is no solution because mm -hmm. there is no cause of problem. There is no problem. Mm -hmm. And I actually relied on my lucid dreams purely to actually experience my whole entire life structure. And that was when I first found lucid dream. I actually got so caught up in it that I was actually dedicating just everything and everything and everything into just how I wanted to live my life within the dream state. So then what happened was, going back to the dualistic vibe, is in my waking reality, I actually lost the love for it almost. And I mm -hmm. thought, well, why am I in this waking reality if I can have a great time flying in another reality? And that is again going back into the balance thing and remaining in the middle way. And I actually think there is just as much magic in this waking reality as there is in the other Now, this is something reality. you said to me earlier on when we were having yeah, a little chat. Sure. And I think, this is, I think this is brilliant. I think this is a wonderful insight, frankly. And uh, I think that when, when you come to that understanding, mm. I think you really are starting to wake up in, in the dream. And when I use that, I don't mean the sleeping dream, I mean the, the waking dream. The waking dream. Um, yeah. That really is the moment when your imagination starts to eclipse itself, when exactly. you start to really transcend the thought and recognize the true wonder of what it's all about is trying to find the beauty in this experience. Yes. And this is what the Tao is. The Tao is to recognize that ultimately it's all magic. It's all magic. You know, Everything Terence McKenna once said, uh, in terms of, uh, he was talking about matter, atoms, electrons, and he had some wonderful quote about the electron being the gaping mouth of the wormhole that leads to a quadrillion of multidimensional galaxies. And then concluded by saying, matter doesn't lack magic, matter is magic. And, you know, the audience erupted into laughter when he said it. So when the physicist is talking about, well, there's no such thing as magic, I'm like, you're looking at it. You, at <laughs> you it are right the there, introspective yeah. atoms Proof. staring down the microscope at yourself. <laughs> What's looking back at you is the universe right back at you. Exactly. Um, you know, and, and I think that when you understand the wonder of every single mm -hmm. thing, that everything is full of magic, really then is. you really are waking up. 